Nature can be scary. There's a myriad of animals out there all utilizing a huge variety of weapons in order to survive. Chief among these being venom and poison. Thanks to these two, there's octopus the size of soda cans and frogs the size of your thumbnail that can kill an adult human 10, 50, even 100 times over. But what separates these two and how do animals utilize them and will there ever be an animal program that I go to where the parents won't ask if the snakes that I brought for the kids to hold are poisonous? Next time. I'm on Dragon Ball. N no, no, find, find out after the intro. Thanks to venom and poison, some of the things you most need to look out for in nature are some of the smallest or most fragile things like frogs and snakes and spiders and bugs and jellyfish and even plants. When I go walking in the woods behind my house, I'm not worried about getting mauled by a Siberian tiger or a grizzly bear. I'm worried about walking through poison ivy. So what are these bizarre concoctions? Well, to start off, poison and venom are both toxins and a toxin is a substance created by a living organism that can do harm to another living Living organism. Now poisonous and venomous are often used interchangeably as I can attest because just about every animal program I've done of the hundreds I've done I get asked by at least one person to show if the snake is poisonous and you'll see this in the news and movies and TV shows. I've even heard narrators in nature documentaries and stuff say the snake or bug or something is poisonous and venomous. Poison is not venom and vice versa. Venom is a toxic substance that needs to be injected into the body. There is an active delivery system to this to get the venom directly into the victim's bloodstream. And this is where you get snake and spider fangs, you get scorpion stingers, you get the barbs on certain types of fish like lionfish. Poison, on the other hand, is passive. You absorb the toxin either by eating it or touching it or even breathing it in. So if you're a villain in like a spy or an action movie, you're never gonna kill James Bond by trapping him in a venom chamber. And on the flip side of that, you're never gonna kill Indiana Jones by trapping him in a pit filled with poisonous snakes, unless he gets hungry down there and tries snacking on one. Venom is primarily a predatory technique and allows even small predators the ability to catch and subdue their prey very quickly. Poison, on the other hand, again, being more passive, it's a defense mechanism. It allows certain animals that predators are trying to eat to not get eaten or to kill the predator in the process so that they don't get eaten, such as poison dart frogs or even some butterfly species. To make matters more complex, there's actually a few animals out there in nature that can do both of these things. They are venomous and poisonous, such as the Asian tiger snake, where it can inject venom from its fangs, but it also can extract poison from the toes that it eats, and it can use this to make their own poison that they can secrete from special glands on their body. And these things came about because of the biological arms race. Like Gordon's speech to Batman at the end of Batman Begins, escalation can be very problematic. In the dark city of Gotham, the Gotham Police Department start wearing bulletproof vests. The bad guys get armor-piercing rounds. Batman runs around on rooftops beating up criminals, and eventually, someone will rise up to challenge him on his level. And the same thing happens in nature. You have animals that aren't good at camouflaging or running away or dropping their tail, so they evolve a different means of deterring predators. But on the reverse side of that, while you have some animals that are evolving their poison, you have other animals that are evolving to deal with that. Take Kali, my eastern indigo snake, or really any king snake species, really. They are primarily snake eaters, but where they're from, there are a lot of venomous snake species to contend with. So as some snakes got bit trying to prey upon a rattlesnake or a copperhead, they would die, but others might survive and then over countless years of evolution, the ones that survive the venom reproduce and build up this venom tolerance across the generations. So then as the immunity outperforms the venom, you'll also have rattlesnakes over generations of evolution increasing the potency of their venom so that they can try and do more damage. And eventually you're gonna end up with one outpacing the other and that's where we're at like right now with the indigo snakes and the king snakes being immune to these snakes' venom so they can successfully prey on copperheads, cottonmouths, rattlesnakes. But this also happens with poison. Take, for example, the infamous cane toad that has these massive poison glands right behind the eye that secrete bufotoxin once they're in the predator's mouth to trickle down and kill them so they can hop away. In their native range of Central and South America, there are a lot of predators that have evolved to be able to consume and eat cane toads, poison and all, to little or no ill effect, such as different snake species, snapping turtles, possums. They have all been observed eating cane toads and walking away no problem. And this is what can make animals with such potent poison so dangerous as invasive species because the predators 
in this new landscape that they're introduced to aren't properly equipped to deal with the overpowering poison that cane toads have evolved over millennia to keep up in this arms race. And that's why like in Australia, you hear about so many monitor lizards and quolls and other smaller predators all dying off at such alarming rates in areas where cane toads have been introduced. And this is also why you'll see statistics that seem like a little bit of overkill, like how the tiny golden poison dart frog has enough poison in it at any given time to kill 10 adult humans, or that one bite from the inland taipan has enough venom in it to kill a hundred adult humans. These are the results of these species' constant competition with predators and prey to make their venom or poison or resilience the winner. Creating this poison or venom is also a very taxing process on the body. It takes a lot of energy to make this stuff. And a lot of people think that snakes and spiders and all these animals, they have this infinite pool of venom or poison to rely on, but that's just not true. They have a finite amount. They have to make it and then store it in their venom or poison glands. And then when they use it up, that's it. That's all they have until they can go and make more. And this is where you'll get a lot of animals kind of working around it because it is such a high energy thing. You're gonna have animals trying to find shortcuts and ways to avoid this very taxing process. So you'll have animals maybe evolve the potency of their venom so they won't need to deliver as much because their venom is that much stronger. Or you'll have animals that maybe will increase the storage of their venom or poison so they won't necessarily have the most dangerous venom but they can deliver a lot of it. And then you'll have animals that evolve to not really need the poison or venom like the Asian forest scorpion here. Now she does have venom in that stinger, all scorpions do, but her venom's very mild, it's weaker than a bee sting. She didn't really need to evolve it to be super dangerous like the Indian red scorpion, which is considered the deadliest scorpion on the planet because she has these giant pinchers to grab and crush her food with. So when I feed her crickets, she never uses the stinger, she just uses her claws. And this is why you'll see a lot of display defense mechanisms such as the dimatic display of the cobra's hood or the rattle snakes rattle or a posematic coloration where bright colors in nature are there for a specific warning saying get away like the poison dart frogs they don't want to have to use their venom or poison unless absolutely necessary take rattlesnakes for example they don't want to use their venom on some hiker that's getting too close which something like three quarters of all venomous rattlesnake bites happen in the u.s because the person is trying to mess with it or trying to kill it so just leave rattlesnakes alone but anyways so they don't want to waste their venom on a person but you have this big hulking figure getting closer and closer to them and they're not listening to the rattlesnake's loud rattle so they will use their venom as a last way to defend themselves. But even then, venomous snakes can do this thing called dry bites where they will bite the potential predator but they won't release any venom so the predator feels two giant fangs go in them and that might be enough to scare them away. Now I wouldn't really use this as a means to like self-rationalize trying to pick up venomous snakes, just leave venomous snakes alone but it is a means for them to bite and scare away predators and not waste any venom. And you don't need to be terrified of these animals, even if they are poisonous or venomous, because the vast majority of them are really no threat to people. I mean, if you're allergic to venom, that's kind of a different thing entirely. But for the rest of us, I mean, the tarantulas, there are no lethal tarantulas. And for scorpions of the 1700 plus species of scorpion, only I think about two dozen of them are actually considered like lethal dangerous to humans. But you've also got like butterflies and all these other random animals that they are poisonous or venomous, but they are really no threat to people. And for the ones that are dangerous, they're pretty easy to spot for the most part. I mean, you will probably hear a rattlesnake's rattle long before you actually see the rattlesnake. And I don't think I've ever heard of anyone accidentally stepping on or picking up a poison dart frog. If you're out in the woods or the forest or something, wherever you live, and you see a green mamba, a tiger snake, dart frogs, a red scorpion, any number of these animals, just give them their space, respect them, and go on your way. These poisons and venoms also serve a really important role for humans as a society because without them, we wouldn't have nearly the same level of medical advancements or medications or research that we currently have. By analyzing the components of Gila monster venom, we were actually able to isolate certain bioactive peptides from it that created the basis for a line of type two diabetes medications. By analyzing the poison from the phantasmal dart frog, scientists created a painkiller 200 times more potent than morphine, although the medicinal dose is very close to a lethal dose, so that's still kind of a work in progress. And two of the three main drugs for heart attacks in the United States come from snake venom. And the pain medication Zyconotide is a synthetically crafted version of a peptide from cone snail venom. And these are just a few examples of how poisons and venoms created by nature to kill have actually been turned around and utilized to help save human lives. So those were the differences between venom and poison. 
These, these are both venomous animals though, but those are the differences and how they work. Thank you to our amazing patrons for helping to support the channel. If you'd like to do that for as little as three bucks a month, link for that will be down below. Like the video if you learned something, make sure you subscribe for the videos I post every single Thursday. Thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you later.